For a deeper dive on Canada's position on the war in the Middle East, I'm here with Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie. Hi, Minister Jolie. Great to have you back in studio. Thank you. It's ha I'm happy to be here. I really appreciate you making the time. Mm -hmm. I, I want to start off with the vote at the UN and ask you, yeah. Minister, why did your government vote for an unconditional ceasefire? Well, first and foremost, what we did, and we've been saying it for now a couple of weeks, the violence must stop. And we saw also that the humanitarian pause helped because hostages, nearly half of the hostages, Vashi, were able to uh, be released. And also more humanitarian aid was able to get in Gaza. And so we came up with this important statement with Australia and with New Zealand, where we said that uh, we needed to have a sustainable humanitarian ceasefire, which was conditional on hostages being released, of course, by a humanitarian aid being able to allow uh, in Gaza and at the same time also foreign nationals including Canadians being able to uh, get out of Gaza. We've also said that Hamas being a terrorist organization should not be involved in any future governance of Gaza because we believe that there is a path towards a two-state solution and we need to make sure that we get to that two-state solution process. That statement you release though as you mentioned makes a ceasefire predicates it on those conditions associated with Hamas. However, at the UN, that's not what happened. There were amendments put forward that stipulated those conditions. Canada supported them, but ultimately Indeed. the UN voted them down. Your government still decided to support the resolution, which was free of any conditions. You did support a vote. You voted yes for an unconditional ceasefire. Why did you not just abstain from that vote? So we also registered an explanation of vote along with our vote which included the conditions which i mentioned so that is why our position at the un is clear we also worked with many other countries including of course australia and new zealand which had come up with the statement to make sure that we had the same type of vote and we voted also uh, along 153 countries that supported it we believe that the next steps should be clear in terms of what can be sustainable peace in the region. For too long, we haven't had the right parties at the table to give the right credibility for the creation of a Palestinian state living side by side in peace and also security with a Israeli state. And I do want to ask you about the feasibility of a two-state solution, but on the vote, just because you say Canada's position is clear doesn't make it so, This vote, you could have abstained from that vote because of your preference to see conditionality attached to Hamas, but you didn't. Canada made a very distinct decision to vote differently than it has in the past when confronted with the same issue. Are you saying that you don't support an unconditional ceasefire, but you did vote for one? I'm saying that we've been clear in terms of calling for a sustainable humanitarian ceasefire uh, with conditions. I've also, I think that we have to stick, take stock of the situation evolving. Uh, Vashi, the UN Secretary General did something that was, uh, that hadn't been done since the 70s last week when he called and triggered Article 99 of the UN Charter, calling what was happening in Gaza a humanitarian catastrophe. And so as a country that believes in multilateralism, we have to take stock of that. And that's why we wanted to make sure that we had a clear position. At the same time, we know very much that this conflict has been a very difficult one to address with many, many subtleties, and that is why we did an explanation of vote. Is it Article 99 that changed the parameters or what informed your ultimate decision? Because there have been calls from those multilateral organizations that you point to for a ceasefire as far back as October 18th when the Secretary General of the UN first called for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. On November 6th, the World Health Organization called for an immediate humanitarian uh, ceasefire. That's an entire month ago. Is it just Article 99 that pushed Canada over to that side? I think that the humanitarian pause was important, and the which led to hostages being able to be released and humanitarian aid going in. And like I mentioned, the resumption of violence was absolutely devastating. Uh, and afterwards, we saw Israel's resumption of violence or Hamas's. Both parties, and of course, we know that right now what Hamas is doing is not only holding hostages, but using Palestinians as civilian shields 
Also, we know that there was sexual violence on October 7th. They've been also continuing to attack Israel. We know at the core of our foreign policy that first, the right for Israel to exist has been at the core of it, and also the protection of civilians. And so bearing that in mind, we decided to take this decision, which was not an easy one, but which was important as the conflict is pursuing. Do you think that Israel, or is it your view that Israel has breached international law in retaliating in those October 7th terror attacks? The October 7th attacks were one of the biggest terrorist attacks in the world, and definitely the biggest on Israel. And we saw and we heard uh, from different testimonies of, of hostages, of, of families of hostages, uh, it was absolutely horrific. And that's why it was important that we stood up, and we still do, in terms of uh, supporting Israel's right to defend when being attacked. But how it does so matters. And the protection of civilians is extremely important. I've had difficult conversations with my counterpart on this very issue. Uh, and I'm not the only foreign minister of the G7 having had these conversations, including, of course, the Americans. In those conversations, those difficult conversations you say you've had with your counterpart, for example, in yep. Israel, did you convey the view that you believe or that Canada believes Israel, uh, Israel's response to those awful terror attacks has not been commensurate or amounts to collective punishment or that they have not protected civilians to the degree they should, all of which would amount to a breach of international law? Because you didn't answer the specific question, which was whether it is the government's view that Israel has breached international law, and thus that informs the vote you took at the UN. Well, there will be, of course, a lot of work being done by different organizations on fact-finding, and of course, we will hold uh, perpetrators accountable, and especially, of course, Hamas. Uh, and I've been clear on this. On the question of having these difficult uh, conversations, the protection of civilians, of course, Vashi. Of course, we've been having these conversations. I've had it with my counterpart. I've had it also uh, with uh, many colleagues. And we have many statements of the G7 calling for the protection of civilians. But does that mean, de facto, you believe civilians are not being protected? That Israel is not doing everything it can to avoid hurting or killing civilians? Well, we, you've heard what the G7 has mentioned, which is, of course, the protection of civilians and the respect of international humanitarian law needs to, be re, uh, the, needs to be at the core of Israel's reaction. And why do we say it? We've said it because we believe that more needs to be done. And indeed, So you don't believe that they're doing everything they can to protect civilians? I think that more needs to be done. We're at, now, at this point nearly at 19,000 civilians, mainly women and children, 70% being women and children, that have been... Uh, that, that have died. And so you see in the statement that has been signed by us, by Australia, and also by New Zealand, that we call for that. And we also believe that um, you know, Hamas as a terrorist organization uh, is a threat to Israel. It is definitely a threat to the region. It is a threat to the world. And so that's why we want to make sure that as we continue the diplomatic conversations, about peace and stability in the region, they can't be at the table. They can't be part of the future governance of Gaza. Israel, though, says it's in a fight for its existence. You recognize that Israel has a right of to course. defend its existence. Yeah. Is it your view? I, I'm still a little confused. You, you want them to do more to protect civilians. They argue that they are and that this is them defending their existence, defending themselves against a terror attack. Do you not think that is the case? I profoundly believe that as a state, they have to do what is absolutely necessary to abide by international law. And we will continue to have these tough conversations, and that's why we sent a clear message at the UN this week. I wanted to also ask you about the feasibility. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, your, your efforts to pursue and help uh, the region pursue a two-state mm -hmm. solution. Uh, the ambassador of Israel to the UK most recently in an interview this week said it's impossible, said that, that you know, Israel is not in favor of a two-state solution. Uh, there are members of Prime Minister Netanyahu's cabinet who have expressed similar sentiments, perhaps even taking it further at points. I looked at the most recent public opinion polling of both Palestinians and Israelis. Only about a third of them support, at this point, a two-state solution. Do you actually believe one is feasible? There's no other choice, and there's no other path. And uh, we need to have a constructive government in Israel that believes in the two-state solution. And we need to have the right Palestinian voices, which are not Hamas, that believe in it. Um, 
it's been 30 years that uh, we've been talking about it, but there's been a lot of actions to undermine it, including on both sides. And I think as Western leaders, we have to reckon that we haven't ha done a good job enough to bring this solution to the table. Talking about it, but not enough actions. So Do I think, think the possibility of it though, after what has occurred over the last two months is diminished even relative to where it was prior to the start, prior to Hamas's initial attack. You know what, Vashi, I think the contrary. Really, I why? Think, I think because this, this conflict is so difficult for Israel, so difficult for the Palestinians, so difficult for the world, not only in Canada because we've seen the rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of Islamophobia, and just the rise of tension. But that's the case here. That's the case in Europe. That's the case south of our border. That's the case in Arab countries. We are in amidst an international security crisis. So we need to take a chance on peace. You mentioned for peace to have a chance, Hamas cannot be at the table for those discussions. Iran funds and arms Hamas. Yeah. Why does your government refuse to list the IRGC as a terrorist entity? So I think just back going back on Hamas, um, it is also very important that Hamas lay down its weapons. That's also part of our approach when it comes to Hamas. Uh, when it comes to Iran, we know that Iran is states, a state sponsor of terror. Um, and because there's clear links between their different proxies, including, uh, of course, we know Hamas. Um, uh, that being said, we have one of the most stringent and, uh, and, and tough approach in the world when it comes to Iran. But I'm committed to working particularly with the Iranian community and uh, particularly also with the PS752 families, which I've been in touch with a lot uh, on this issue because I know that the, f the, the, the community is fearful of the RGC. Yes, they are very much. And yeah. it's, it's actually their... Um, their conversations with me, their ask of me informing the question to you about why your government has, in the years even since PS752, but now, especially in light of what's happened in the Middle East, refused to list them as a terrorist entity. You, in 2018, voted on a motion in favor, in Parliament, in the House of Commons, to do just that. Five years later, you're the person who could make it happen, yeah. and you're not. The community feels your government has not ever given them a specific answer about why not. Can you provide one right now? I think that we have to work on the best tools to do it. I think that we have to meanwhile continue to uh, assure the, the, the protection of our diplomats, our military that can be in the region. And that's why I had a very good conversation with key uh, Iranian uh, community uh, leaders here in Canada over the last weeks in Ottawa and we'll do more in the coming year on this issue. Does that mean that you're worried about retaliation in Iran if you were to do list the IRGC? I can't comment on that but what I can tell you when it comes to diplomacy reciprocity is always an issue but that being said what I can tell you is we have the right have the right tools to address this issue and I'm committed to working with my colleagues at public safety at justice on developing the right tools. Does that mean that you have not ruled out listing it as a terrorist entity? Clearly, we will always have one of the toughest approach against Iran in the world. I don't know what that means. I know that you've done a lot of things that I wouldn't intimate that you haven't because you've done a ton of sanctions. There are still, according to Global News, 700 people with ties to the regime in Canada. What I'm telling and, you and you're is not, that... But you're it, not saying whether or not you... You're, you've, I'm just asking if you've ruled no, no, it out no, or not. No, of course, Vashi, and I understand your question. What I'm telling you is that we've done a lot, but we can do more and we'll do more. I take so that. I'll have more to say in the coming weeks on so this So I take issue. that it's not impossible. I'm telling you that, of course, we'll be working on the with the community on this, and I think that we have to be creative to develop new approaches and new tools that would permit government to do what is needed. Okay, Minister, I'll leave it there. I appreciate <laughs> your time as always. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you.